Morning guys. Uh, so yesterday we took a look at the quadratic formula. Uh, essentially when I have something in the uh, formula ax squared plus bx plus c equals to zero, we found it was really hard to isolate because one was a square term, one actually was just a power one term. Uh, luckily the quadratic formula actually gives you uh, everything manipulated for you, everything isolated so that you can just take the constants a, b, and c, operate on those. Yes, there was a weird plus or minus going through it, but we can actually get the roots. Uh, I'm going to give you a quick practice question there. Afterwards, we also did uh, some work on triangles. We're going to be dealing mainly with uh, right angle triangles, which means there's always a 90 degree angle. Uh, we practice through sort of using Pythagoras and starting to introduce those sine, cosine, and tangent uh, and trying to interlink some of the uh, different sides. So uh, let's just do this as a quick warm up here. Uh, first practice here I just want to do is just a um, quadratic formula for you. So let's go. 2m squared minus 7m minus 3 is equal to 0. Right? Don't worry that the letter is actually m as opposed to like x or time from earlier. Uh, what I want to do here is I want to find m. So use a quadratic formula and solve your way through for m. Uh, and then I also want you to just practice. I'm going to write the question for you here first. Uh, I'm going to give you uh, two triangles here. Uh, it's annoying when the triangle is sort of off at some oblique angle. It's sort of uh, I'm looking at it sort of when it's tilted and twisted. You might just need to uh, figure out the um, sort of which side is which uh, for yourself here. Uh, let's punch in here. Let's give you this bottom side is actually an 11. Let's give you this side is 6. I want you to find for me uh, what is this x here uh, and what is uh, this angle theta. Right? So again, I would encourage you to just pause the video, try it out for yourself. Uh, when we are finished that, you can come back and take a look at the uh, solution. So let's just start off with number one here. Number one here is in the format of the quadratic formula. So a this time is two, b is going to be the negative seven, and c is going to be the negative three. We're going to punch it through the quadratic here. m is equal to negative b, plus or minus the root of b squared minus four ac, all over two times a. Let's just crunch our way through. Negative of a negative seven plus minus Careful, you put the b with the negative in brackets, so that should be a positive 49. We minus 4 times a, which is 2, c, which is negative 3. We multiply it all over 2 times a, so 2 times 2. And then we're going to end up getting here negative times negative is 7, plus minus, just type in uh, what's underneath the square bracket there, 49 minus 4 times 2 times negative 3. This one here gives me, double check my numbers, um, get, getting about a root of 73 underneath. So this time, it wasn't a really nice number, but still, the quadratic formula still gives you the correct uh, uh, roots. So let's take the root of uh, 73 here. So this gives me 7 plus minus. Don't worry about the um, how many rounding we're going to do. We'll do that in a later lesson, but let's just keep it. Oh, it's about 8.54. At this point here, I'm ready to take the plus root or the negative root here. So we're going to do one answer is 7 plus 8.54 divided by 4, while the other answer is 7 minus 8.54 divided by 4. Careful that binomial here is in the top. You have to do the plus or the minus first, and then do the divide by 4 afterwards. So let's add 7 divided by um, 8.54, give or take a little bit of rounding. Add 7 divided by 4. This gives me here 3.89, give or take. And the other root here, 7 minus 8.54 divided by 4 is equal to negative 0 0.385. Those are my two roots. Even though mathematically we may actually have two solutions, if this were physics, if this were time, we would know, well, time can actually go into the negatives. We might actually reject some of these mathematical solutions in favor for which one actually makes sense for your setup. Dealing with question number two here, let's see if we can label some of these variables. So uh, we have theta, we have a right angle triangle. I know the side that's across from the right angle triangle is called the hypotenuse. Relative to this theta here, this 6 here is going to be called the adjacent side. What I don't know is actually the opposite side. And they're just using x as just some unknown here. x doesn't necessarily mean horizontal, but in this case, they actually want you to find the opposite. Now, certainly we can actually just use Pythagoras, right? Because I have uh, two of the sides, I can find the third side. Let's just practice through there. a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Again, the only challenging bit here is make sure uh, the hypotenuse always goes over c. It doesn't matter what you label in for a or b. So let's just plug our way through here. I have 6 squared. Let's add it to x squared, our unknown squared. Has to equal to 11 squared. My numbers might not turn out really nicely. 36 plus x squared is equal to 11 squared. This gives you 121. 
I can kick the 36 over to the right-hand side by minusing it, so minus 36. x squared is equal to 85. You'll notice this wasn't fully a quadratic expression. I do have a square term, but because I don't have the x to the power 1 term, I don't have any trouble with square rooting. When I take the square root of 85 here, technically, yes, I get the positive or negative root here. I get give or take 9.2 or so. In this case here, because this is a distance, it has to be positive. Again, I choose in favor of the positive root here because that makes physical sense for my solution. Uh, in terms of finding theta, so far up to this point here, we've just been given an angle here. Oh, you can use your SOHCAHTOA. It operates on theta, and it gives you the relationship between the different sides here. Anytime you actually want to find theta here, you actually need to use uh, the second function on your calculator, second sine, or inverse tan, or arc cos. Uh, we just need to undo the cosine, or undo whichever trig function I'm using. Again, the more I know, I actually now know this side here is actually 9.2. Uh, the more I know, I can actually have all three functions available to me, but just in case I did my Pythagoras wrong, let's see if there's a trig function, which trig function actually deals with adjacent and hypotenuse because I'm infinitely confident about the 6 and 11 because those are given in the problem. I say to myself, so, well, so is going to be opposite part. No, nope, can't do that. Cosine, so ka toa, cosine is adjacent to hypotenuse. Oh, that one would work. Or tangent, toa is opposite again. Okay, so cosine it is. So we're going to write out, I would encourage you to write out the formula itself. It's always cosine of your angle is equal to, uh, so, so ka toa, so adjacent over hypotenuse. Let's punch in the variables as we know them. This time, my unknown is actually my theta. Theta, again, is that placeholder. It's usually a letter that's used for um, uh, the angle. It's going to equal adjacent over hypotenuse. My adjacent side is 6. My hypotenuse is 11. When I do this ratio 6 over 11, right, that's going to give me some decimal. Fine. And then what I need to do is I actually need to undo the operator of cosine. So again, in your calculators here, usually you just press shift cosine or second cosine. And basically what it does here is undoes the cosine. What you do to one side, I better do to the other. And therefore what's going to happen is we're going to end up just left with theta. The theta is the inverse cosine of 6 over 11. Again, make sure your calculators are in degree mode. Uh, we should get here, do it in brackets, inverse cosine or arc cosine of 6 over 11. This gives me give or take 57 degrees or so. And I was able to undo the cosine function. I was able to get the angle back. And in this case, I didn't even rely on the 9.2 that I found. Just in case I got that number wrong, I don't want that knocking off the remainder. All right. So uh, hopefully you get some uh, more practice uh, with that math on your worksheets, sir. Uh, we're going to continue onwards with this math toolkit here. Let's take a look at our SI units again. So basically, in science, uh, there are so many uh, measuring units that we can measure. Let's say distance, I can measure things in uh, kilometers, feet, inches, micrometers, uh, um, right? uh, light years even. right? So I have so many units here. What we need to decide is one set of units. This is going to be my standard. So that whether I do science in Canada or everywhere around the world, uh, when I actually come up with the formulas, I want to put everything back in the SI units so that um, we're all talking the similar language. So in terms of the SI units, surprisingly, the list is actually fairly uh, short. The three SI units that will be more most important to us, maybe four, uh, we'll set up a quick table here. I'm going to label for you the quantity, sort of what we're measuring, and then I'm going to give you uh, the standard unit, um, the unit on this side here. It's called SI because it's an international system of units. It comes out of the French. It's like système international, something like that. But pretty much it's an internationally recognized set of units. Let's start off measuring, like I mentioned, a distance or a length. Length, you can use L, shorthand that L, um, um, quantity there. And then in terms of the distances that we have, what we choose as our standard is actually a meter. So I'm going to go uh, meter like that. And then we're going to use M to shorthand that. So whenever we measure things as distances here, make sure everything is put back in meters before we actually uh, crunch our way through the formulas. Other types of quantities we can measure are mass. Right? The mass of something is also going to be m. Uh oh, both of them are m. You can actually read it based on the context here. If I see something like 10m, right, where m is the unit, that probably means 10 meters. Or if I have something like m equals to 10, if something is equal to that, this is probably saying mass. So from the context, you can probably specify, are we talking mass? Are we talking meters here? The SI unit for uh, mass is actually going to be kilograms. Right. 
because we're going to be talking about sort of cars and planes and things. Kilogram is a convenient unit, right? Grams is a little bit too small. In chemistry, they actually use grams as a SI unit, so that's a little bit strange, but at least in physics, we're going to use kilograms. Um, but uh, we're going to find that this kilo here, kilo is a prefix. It's a little syllable that comes before a word, and it just gives me a rough power of 10. I can actually move that kilo prefix. I can have a kilometer or a kilosecond for the one that's coming up next. Kilo just gives me a rough power of 10. The next quantity I'm going to look at here is like a time measure. So if I want to, uh, I'm interested in how long something takes, uh, we're going to use seconds. I alluded to that there. For seconds, just shorthanded S, right? Nice um, uh, sort of increment of time there. Uh, we can convert to minutes years later on. I can convert to things that are smaller, milliseconds, microseconds, things like that. But at least seconds is a nice sort of convenient unit. Uh, I'm going to actually give you one more here. Uh, that is going to be temperature. Uh, we'll come back later on in this course here to take a look at uh, sort of uh, kinetic energy and speeds of particles. That's going to be related to temperature. And for temperature, for science, we actually need to convert over to an absolute scale called the Kelvin scale, and it's going to be something Kelvin. Right? Uh, I mentioned to you here, this SI list here is actually fairly short. In fact, all other quantities that you can think about, all other quantities, can be derived, I'm sorry, they sometimes call them derived units, can be derived by combining these units. Right. So now there are a couple other SI units, but the list is only about maybe uh, six or seven long. Okay. But what about all the other quantities I like doing in science? What about things like, oh, I'm interested in measuring speed a lot of times. I don't see an SI unit for speed. Well, speed, as we're going to see in our first big chapter here, is speed is actually the mass divided by the time. If I, uh, sorry, uh, length divided by time. If I take a distance, if I take a how far you get, and I divide it by how long it takes you, that actually gives you your speed. Or what if I'm interested in calculating here, what's the density of something? Right? Think about your formula here, density. Density is supposed to be mass over volume. Great, we have a SI unit for mass. I have this one, but I don't have something for volume. But for volume, volume is actually a measuring of sort of how much room is taken up. It's measuring a 3D space. If you imagine things to be a cube, just for simplicity for now, well, a volume is essentially just length times length times length, right? Length multiplied by itself three times. So you see by combining some of these SI units here, we can actually give rise to all the other uh, units that we're interested in, uh, which is sort of the power of these SI units here. We can keep this list fairly short. In fact, in physics, they really like calling these ones here. Instead of just calling them SI units, they call them MKS units. And basically, it stands for M for meters, K for the kilograms, and S for the seconds. They're saying in our standard set of units. This is actually going to be the first check to any problem. We want to make sure we're in the correct SI units before we try to uh, do any solving or evaluating later on. One other little reminder here, sort of introduced in this kilo as a prefix here. Depending on the quantity that you're measuring, um, sometimes if your uh, quantity is really, really big, let's say the distance from here to the sun, I probably don't want to measure in meters. Right? I'm going to carry around a huge, huge number. I might need to use scientific notation for that. Uh, what I want to do is I want to choose a unit that is roughly comparable to the sizes I'm measuring. If I'm measuring cars, kilograms is nice. I don't want to measure in milligrams, things like that. So what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to just rehash with you some of those metric prefaces. All our counting system is on metric, uh, which is based off a of power of 10 system. For these metric prefaces here, you will want to memorize uh, the most common ones. Uh, you're going to already know a lot of these here. We're going to just sort of lay out our table here, just starting going from sort of biggest to smallest here. Let's start off going from the big one here, like mega. Mega is capital M there. Mega actually implies 10 to the 6. For positive powers, it's easy because that just tells you exactly how many zeros there are. For example, if I have one mega, because this is a prefix, this syllable comes before, I can mix and match it with any of these SI units from earlier. So I can have, let's say, one megameter. Right away, that means one million meters. So when I talk about the distance going from here to the sun, instead of talking in terms of meters where I'm carrying around huge, huge powers, if I start using mega, maybe the number can come a little bit smaller. I'm going to skip two prefaces here. There is a 10 to the 5, 10 to the 4. It's just that we don't use that very often. The next seven are used really, really commonly. So make sure you know these ones. We have kilo, like we have for kilograms, K for kilo. 
one kilo of something means 10 to the power of 3. So for example, one kilogram from earlier, 1,000 grams. Easy. Right? One step down from that there, we get hecto as a prefix. Back in the olden days when people owned uh, hectares of land, it was based off this prefix here. Because we're just taking steps in powers of 10, hecto is actually going to be 10 to the 2. So again, I can mix and match this prefix, this h, with any of the base units up above. I can have, let's say, a hectosecond. A hectosecond would be a hundred second. So maybe I'm talking about some context where th talking in hundreds is actually convenient. Uh, now we're getting pretty close to the base unit. So the base unit essentially has an order of magnitude of one. It actually has no prefix. Right? It's just your plain old meter or your plain old Kelvin or whatever. In this case here, the one above the base unit and below the base unit, they both start off with D. Deca is the one that goes on top and deci is the one that's smaller. Deca is sometimes spelled with a K, but I'm going to spell it with a C for a reason here. If I want to shorthand deca, because both of them start off with D, I can't have both of them as D. Let's put D for deci, but deca, I'm actually going to use DA something. Uh, deca Kelvin, deca second. Deca actually implies 10 to the power of 1, whereas deci actually implies 10 to the negative 1. When we start dropping to the negative powers, we're actually moving the decimal place to the left instead, and this actually gives rise to 0 0.1 instead. And again, what you can do is you can mix and match any of these ones here. I can have 1 deca Kelvin, right? 1 dA Kelvin, right? 1 dec is going to be 10 Kelvin, right? So depending on the what I'm actually measuring, how big or how small it is, it might be convenient for me to actually uh, use a prefix to actually introduce uh, the power of 10. Uh, as we go down from there here, let's take a meter stick and let's chop it up into 100 segments. We get a centimeter, so centi, c is the next prefix over, 10 to the negative 2. In fractions, that would actually mean 1 over 10 to the positive 2, or 0 0.01. What this is saying here is this is saying 1 centimeter is actually equal to 0 0.01 meters. We're going to find as we do conversions later on this lesson here, we just need one true relationship. I don't really like carrying around such uh, small numbers like decimals like that. So I can come up with another relationship. What if I have one of the bigger thing? What if I have, let's say, one meter? Well, that would then mean I have 10 to the positive 2. I need 100 centimeters to make it a meter. We'll see that uh, upcoming later on. So centi is uh, 100th in the opposite direction. If you take a centimeter and chop it up uh, again into 10 spaces, we're going to end up with milli. Milli is actually going to be lowercase m here. That's actually 10 to the negative 3. It's 1 1,000, so 0 0.001. It's like taking the number 1 and moving the decimal place here 1, 2, 3 over. The first power of 10 just brought you past the 1, so therefore we only have two zeros before the decimal. So 0 0.001 of a meter. As you skip down again, I'm going to skip 10 to the negative 4, 10 to the negative 5. We'll end off here with micro. Here we run into a problem. I've already used capital M here for the mega. I've used lowercase m for milli. In this case here for micro, I'm going to switch over to the Greek. The Greek equivalent for um, m is actually a mu symbol. So this one here is the Greek letter. The Greek letter mu. Basically it's like a u with a, a longer tail there. And that means a millionth uh, in the sort of smaller direction. In fact, if you heard of the word here, one micron, one micron is unit of distance. One micron is actually shorthand for one micrometer. And micro is exactly this issue here. It's a millionth of a meter. One micron or one mu meter is actually 10 to the negative 6 of a meter or 0 0.00001 meters. Right? So depending on the context that we're working with, we might want to attach a prefix uh, so that I'm not carrying around super small numbers or super big numbers here. Uh, so what I want to do here is I just want to introduce to you how we're going to do our conversions. How can we sort of swap from one set of units to another set of units? Uh, this one here, we'll do unit conversions. Uh, you get introduced to this uh, in math class and other science classes. I just want to make sure we're on the same uh, footing here. For this conversions uh, stuff here, what we're going to do is we're going to set up our units to cancel out. And the general structure we're going to be practicing here is we're going to always be asked the unit that we want. So I'm going to put question mark what we want. We're going to start off with the unit that we currently have. And how I'm going to accomplish the unit uh, conversion here is I'm actually going to multiply by a fraction. Just like this one here is in the numerator, to cancel something in the numerator, I'm going to take the unit that I have, I'm going to stick that unit down below. 
so that the unit top unit cancels bottom unit, and I'm going to be left with what I want up above here. That's the general structure we're going to uh, play with, and as we step through a little bit more complexity here, uh, we're going to get some practice with this. So let's start off here. I want you to convert for me here how many uh, centimeters? How many centimeters in 3.5 meters? Right. If I convert it from my base unit, which had no prefix, to something that has a centi prefix here, how many centimeters would I count? Hopefully you can do that in your head. Well, three and a bit uh, meters would be 350 meters. Uh, sorry, 350 uh, centimeters. Uh, we're just going to just show it uh, with this unit conversion set up here. My final unit they want in centimeters, so I'm going to put question mark centimeters. That's just a nice reminder for me that my final answer is going to come out in centimeters. What we're going to do here is we're going to start off with the number as given. So 3.5 meters, unfortunately it's in the meter unit that I don't want. If this is your first time seeing it, it's going to feel a little bit weird. What we're going to do is we're going to set up a fraction. That's going to be my conversion factor. That's going to be how I change from one unit to the other unit. What I'm going to do is I'm actually going to deal with the letters first. I'm not going to deal with the numbers yet. So currently my unit is meters. I don't want it anymore. I'm going to stick the meters down below so that top unit cancels bottom unit. The letter that I want is I want centimeters. I'm going to actually put centimeters up above. In this case here, the meters would have canceled out and now I've gotten centimeters. That's the first step, just sort of laying out the units so they cancel out. And now what we want is we want to have one true relationship that links these two units. There's actually an infinite number of uh, um, uh, number of combinations that you can do to do this conversion. I just need one true relationship. I generally find the easiest one is decide between these two units which one is bigger. In this case here we have meters and we have centimeters. Well meter is definitely bigger than centimeter. Put a one, put a one beside the bigger unit. And if you do that, what's going to happen is all the other, like even if it would have been a negative power, positive power, all the negative powers have now become positive. So if you look back from earlier here, centi was actually expressed to us. Centi actually means 10 to the negative 2. There was actually a sort of decimal to go with it. In this case here, it wouldn't make sense if I go 10 to the negative 2 centimeters. I can't have 0 0.01 of a tiny unit make a big unit. In fact, what's happened by putting a 1 beside the unit that's bigger, even if my powers were negative, it's now become a positive. I need a hundred tiny little centimeters to make one big guy. And if you just sort of match up uh, what I did for you there, yes, when I introduced you centi from earlier, one centimeter does equal to 10 to the negative two meters. There was actually negative power, but instead, if I put one beside the bigger thing, it's now going to be 10 to the positive. I need 100 centimeters to make a meter. Both of these are true relationships. It just sort of avoids the hassle of dealing with negative powers. I find people make more mistakes when they deal with that negative power. Even though I sort of lay my work like this here, it doesn't mean you need to type it all in. And when I have a divide by 1 here, I'm not going to type that in. It doesn't change the number. I'm going to just take 3.5. I'm going to multiply it by 100, and we get back our 350 from earlier. Do a mental check for yourself. I'm going from meters to a smaller unit. Yes, my number should end up getting bigger. Uh, this conversion factor here uh, can sometimes be called a unitary rate. A unitary rate. So maybe on worksheets they may say use a unitary rate. A uh, unitary rate basically means when I came up with that relationship, at least one of them is actually a one. Right? That's where that word unit comes from. Let's see if I can undo this, right? just to check my work here. If I was interested to figure out how many meters would there be in 350 centimeters, it really shouldn't surprise you if in the one direction I had to multiply by 100 to undo that I need to divide by 100. How do I get that divide by 100 out uh, from the math here is actually um, just using the same unit conversion method. I start off with the unit centimeters. Again, it's going to feel weird. I'm going to multiply by a fraction. I want to get rid of the centimeter unit, so put the centimeter down below. What I want is I actually want meters up above. Now, again, I just need one true relationship uh, between these two here. Um, I'm going to choose a 1 beside the bigger of the two. So in this case here, meter is bigger. So let's go 1 meter is actually equal to 100 centimeters. Numbers on top you would multiply, so I wouldn't bother times 1. It doesn't do anything. But because this is on the bottom, I type this in here, 350 divided by 100, and I get my 3.5 back. Don't worry about the rounding. We'll come back to it in a later lesson. So what was multiplied to go in one direction here to undo I then divide, right? Those are inverses of each other. Let's make it one step harder now. I want to convert here. 
how many decagrams in 6.5 kilograms. Right? So a little bit harder, right? We're still used to a kilo. A kilo is like a thousand grams. They want you to convert between kilo as a prefix to deca. Right? You can, if you have the chart in front of you, you can just count how many steps are between kilo and deca. Because I don't have the chart in front of you here, I'm going to show it to you with this unit cancellation method. So let's try it out here. If we're interested in here, question mark, my final unit is going to be decagram. Remember, deca is the prefix here, da, as a shorthand. If you're ever stuck, just start off with the unit as given. So this is given to me here as 6.5 kilograms. We're now ready to do our sort of conversions here. What I really want to say here, I set up my fraction. I really want to say, well, kilo, top unit cancels bottom unit, and I really want to go to decagrams on top, right? Totally, if I knew that relationship here, no problem. It's just that I may not know off the top of my head how to get from one prefix to the other prefix. The advantage of doing the setup here is actually you can tack on as many fractions one after the other as you want as long as all the other units cancel out and we're actually just left with the unit that we're interested in. So in this case here, because I don't straight know kilo straight to decagram, let's just go kilo back to a regular old gram first because I know kilo is a thousand of a gram. I'm going to tack on yet another fraction. Because I have grams as a unit on top, I don't want it. Stick grams down below, I will then get to decagram. You can tack on as many fractions one after the other as you want. And now we just need to go through punching those true relationships. Which is bigger, a kilo or a gram? Well, kilo should be bigger. So one kilogram is equal to a thousand grams. Which is bigger, a decagram or a gram? Well, one, right? Deca is 10 grams. So I'm going to put a 10 there. And then again, numbers on top, you multiply, on the bottom, you divide. You're going to take 6.5, multiply 1,000, and divide it by 10. Ultimately, you just multiply it by 100 here. So therefore, your final answer, 650, make sure your final answer does have units, decagram. So whenever you're converting from one prefix to the other prefix, one general strategy is go from the prefix back to the base unit, back to having no prefix, so that we can go from the base unit to the new prefix. That's especially, you can memorize the powers of 10 on the prefixes. Those relate to the no prefix case, and we can jump from one prefix through the base unit this way. I'm going to end off with one other conversion for you here. I want you to find for me here how many meters per second is 55 kilometers per hour. This is a conversion we're going to deal with a lot in physics. Essentially, our uh, odometer, our speedometers here in our cars, they give us our speed. They give us, uh, in Canada at least, we measure things in kilometers. Uh, they give us an hour. Yeah, that's a nice sort of time period. Let's say I get in my car this morning and I drive at 55 kilometers per hour, a little bit uh, faster than the speed limit here. It's actually telling me if I traveled at that speed for one whole hour, I would travel 55 kilometers. Unfortunately, when you actually look at that there, you're going to realize both kilo and both the hour, they're both not in the correct uh, unit. In fact, the correct unit here for um, distance is supposed to be just meters. So I need to convert kilometers over to meters. Uh, for hours, I actually need to convert over to seconds. So before I'm able to use any of our equations in the first kinematics chapter here, I need to make sure everything is S in SI units. If they're not in SI units, I can't be guaranteed the units cancel. I can't be guaranteed the formulas will work. So let's just try it out. If I can do this with the unit uh, cancellation method, I want to go question mark meter per second. I want my final answer to be meter per second. This one here is a little bit harder because although I have the number 55, I notice I actually have a fraction in my unit. That's actually a little bit scary. What I want you to do here is I want you to just write out this fraction here explicitly. So write out what does that fraction actually mean. And what that means here is when we have a 55, the 55 always goes to the top unit. That means my car says, I'm going to get 55 kilometers. When you say per hour, what you're actually meaning is you're saying all over per one hour means one hour of this. So if I have a fraction in my unit, the first thing I would do is I would um, just write that fraction out. So I have 55 kilometers all over one hour. And now it's a little bit easier to go, OK. So if I don't want kilometers, I want to get it to meters. Put kilometers on the bottom so they cancel out. So kilometers on bottom, meters on top. If you just did that, you have a strange set of units, meters per hour. And now the only sort of little trick here is hours to seconds. Because hours is right now on the bottom, instead of putting on the bottom, it wouldn't cancel out. I need to put hours on top. 
Now, you may or may not know how many seconds in an hour. I know 60 seconds in a minute, 60 minutes in an hour. If you like, you can tack on as many fractions as you want. Let's say, let's go to minutes first, and then let's tack on another one. What you're starting to see is sort of the top unit keeps canceling the bottom unit until we end up with the ones that we want. In this case here, we're left with a meter on top, we're left with the seconds on the bottom. Which is bigger, a kilometer or a meter? Well, a kilometer is bigger, so one kilometer, hours is bigger, minutes is bigger. And now we're going to go through, I knew a kilo was a thousand. You can check the table on top. That was a metric prefix here. When we deal with minutes and seconds, those are also by definition, but they're just not powers of 10. So we know in this case here, 60 minutes make up an hour, 60 seconds make up a minute. Numbers on top you multiply. So I type 55, I type it in times a thousand. Careful how you type this next part in here. Because the 60 is on the bottom, I'm going to press divide by 60. Don't bother typing any times one or divide by ones. Sometimes people get in the hang of, okay, I divide it by 60, I'm now down here, and then they accidentally press multiply by 60, the calculator doesn't understand this. When the calculator sees the multiply, it thinks the 60 is actually on top, and that's actually not what you want. So it might feel weird here, when I say numbers on the bottom, you divide, I'm going to divide the first 60, I'm going to still press divide by 60. It's as if I had divided the first 60, found the answer, and then I wanted to divide 60 again. Right? So any time it's on the bottom, you divide twice. And in this case here, 55 times 1,000, divide 60, divide 60, gives you roughly 15.3 meters per second. And in fact, as I mentioned, this conversion is going to be done really, really commonly. We're going to very often have speeds written as kilometers per hour, or I'm interested in converting back to kilometers per hour. Unfortunately, it's not a correct SI unit. You can imagine being very tedious. If I had to do three fractions for every speed I need to convert, in this case here, for this exact conversion, we're going to come up with a quick shortcut. I'll show you where the shortcut comes from here. If you imagine, just take 60 times 60. At the bottom here, this part here just becomes 3600. I have 1,000 on top and a 3600 on, on the bottom. If I imagine dividing 1,000, dividing 1,000 here, I'm going to get 3.6. What that says here is this whole conversion boils down to a magic number 3.6, and it only works between this exact set of units. All you need to remember is when are we dividing 3.6 or when are we multiplying 3.6. For me, I just remember the number that goes a meter per second, how, how much distance do you travel every second of time that passes by, the number is always tinier. So for example, in this question, I started off with 55 kilometers per hour. You can double check it for yourself. Try dividing by 3.6. That should give you 15.3. Great, my number for meter per second is a little bit tinier. If I want to undo that, I multiply 3.6 to get it back up. The conversion boils down to 3.6. Those three fractions boil down to 3.6. All you need to remember is when it's multiply and when it's divide. Again, for me, I just remember uh, the number that goes to the unit meter per second is a little bit tinier. So if they give me kilometers per hour, oh, I need to divide to make it smaller. If they want you to convert back to what my speedometer says for kilometers per hour, you then multiply 3.6 back up. Again, this is exactly from kilometers per hour to meter per second. If later on I have uh, meters per minute or kilometers per year or something like that, I can't use 3.6. 3.6 is exactly for this conversion. We'll get a little more practice with this in the next lesson here, uh, but try out your worksheet and see how you do. Thanks, guys.